Warming the Bench. This is Aviator Cast, episode 115. Calling all aviators, you've landed at Aviator Cast, the top podcast resource for interviews, refreshers, lessons, training topics, and more. Join weekly and share in our passion for flying things, exploring the rare air through flight. And now, another episode pre flight complete, fuel on board, and flight plan filed. Let's kick the tires and light the fires. Here's your host, Chris Palmer. Welcome, 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 aviators. You've landed at Aviator Cast. My name is Chris Palmer. Once you've tasted flight, there's just no going back. But sometimes you're on the ground wishing you were in the air. Life gets in the way. It's a struggle to afford rental and fuel costs. And it seems like you're in a downward spiral, downward spiral not quite able to get back into aviation. Thankfully, there are a whole lot of resources out there to help you keep your head in the game. From people to books to plain old hangar talk, there's no reason you can't stay active while working to get back in the air. And that's what today's episode is all about. Today's episode is staying sharp on the ground. Today's episode is about staying sharp on the ground. And uh, it's a bench warmer's guide to aviators. So that's what we're going to be getting into today. I'm going to share with you guys some things that you can use to um, to stay in aviation, keep your head in the game while you're on the ground. As always, Aviator Cast is brought to you by um, Aviator Training by Angle of Attack, offering online ground school wherever you are and flight training in Alaska. Get our Guide to the Sky video series with three hours of free getting started advice and steps. Turn your aviation passion into reality. Sign up today at aviatortraining.com. So for those of you that haven't been to Aviator Cast before, uh, Aviator Cast is a place where we share all things aviation passion. So we get interviews with different people in the industry, whether that be military pilots, airline pilots, bush pilots, uh, commercial pilots, whatever it is, private pilots, everyday pilots, those that just got their pilot license. So all sorts of people to get different perspectives. And then I also share some more uh, training and opinion type uh, podcasts as well, which is what we're going to be going through today, You know, giving you some advice on how to keep your head in the game. So that's at the core what Aviator Cast is all about. You can look back in the library in iTunes or YouTube or wherever you're consuming this content and see what is available. And you can see that we cover a wide range of topics that is actually along the lines of what we're talking about today. So um, we are going to be getting into the content here pretty quickly. But first of all, we always do a review on the show which is um, our way of, um, you know, getting, basically I read a review on the show and I send you a t-shirt. If I read your review on the show, then I will send you that t-shirt. And so I read one of these reviews every week. And this week we have, um, we have a review that just came in a few days ago. Now, if you want to leave a review, you leave that on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, et cetera, somewhere like that. And again, if I read it, then I will send you that t-shirt. So today's review comes to us from Titanium Freak One from the USA. And he says, middle-aged and putting the uh, nose in the books. I've been searching for a worthwhile aviation podcast for a while, but the majority of them are... uh, Actually, I recently decided to take up and follow my childhood dream of becoming a private pilot through listening to your podcast It has inspired me that, yes, old dogs can learn new tricks, and now is a better time than never. This podcast talks about real-life events, roadblocks, that if if you apply yourself, you can accomplish your dream. So I would say that's certainly the case. You know, I talk a whole lot about this particular subject and really try to make an effort for those of you that are struggling to stay in aviation to find a way to get back into it, or if you haven't been in it, getting into it for the first time. There's a lot of information to learn. The industry works a specific way. So it's just a little overwhelming for those that haven't been in it before to then jump in. So 
Um, that's what we're we're in this for. So Titanium Freak One, I appreciate your review. Thanks for doing that. Uh, really excited that you're going to be going through your training here soon, and hope that you find the resources and everything you need to do that successfully. And I wish you the best of luck. Make sure to send me an email, me at aviatorcast.com, and then we can arrange to get you uh, get you on the list to get one of those t-shirts. So that is, uh, that's it for the intro stuff, guys. I want to get right into the content, save some time here, and let's go to it. Let's do that now. All right, so the whole idea of today is to stay sharp while on the ground, and I call this a bench warmer's guide to aviation. So we've all been in that position before, at least most of us, where we've been out of aviation for a while, and whether that be months or weeks or years, there are these periods where we go through less activity or, or just altogether we leave aviation and then when we try to come back to aviation, it's a really difficult process. We find that we're not quite grasping the things we had grasped before. If you're uh, long, if you're a, a, if you're gone long enough, you're gonna find that some things just completely leave your memory. That's happened to me before too, where some things I just completely forgot, and I knew that at one time I did know those things. So the idea here is to keep your head in the game and continue to um, learn things, continue to stay active in the community. Because what I find is that it's not the controlling of the airplane that is the most difficult part or the part that really leaves us. I find that that actually comes back for the most part, almost like riding a bike. It's the procedural stuff. It's looking for certain things in certain places. You know, if you don't know the frequency, for your airport and you're fumbling with the knobs or asking someone what the frequency is, you know, that really interrupts the flow of thought and can slow you down. But if you've kind of studied those things out of your mind or you've been practicing those things in several of the ways that we'll be talking about here today, then those things will already be out of the way and you can focus on just flying the airplane. So uh, I hope that with some of these things that I'm going to share today, um, that'll help you guys out in in uh in staying sharp so that's the whole idea so we're going to be talking about different ways to do that um there are a handful of different means and methods here i'm going to give you some specific um ideas on on where you can go to find good resources who to talk to where to be all these things. So there's a whole laundry list of things here that um, that I'm going to be going through kind of rapid fire. Now, I'm also going to put all of these links and everything that I'm talking about. I'll put these on our website on aviatortraining.com. And if you go there and find the page for this podcast, then you will find links to everything I talk about because I'm going to be talking about books and magazines and different clubs and all these different things that you can take part in that will help you keep your head in the game. So rather than you scratching down those items right now, just uh, just enjoy and listen, and then we will. Uh, you can go to the webpage and actually find those links. That'll be a much more efficient way of doing this. All right, so the first one, and these are not in any particular order of importance, but the first one is setting up a simulator. So here's, here's the deal with simulators. We're in a, an age today where we know that technology is just vastly improved. And as it improves, you know, graphics get better, uh, power gets better, and everything gets cheaper because it becomes more competitive. So that same thing that you see happening in our phones and our iPads and our laptops is happening on flight simulation devices. Now, there are high fidelity, high quality simulation devices now that you can buy. I have one right here um, off to my left that uh, that I use for training and, and for keeping sharp. Um, there are these devices that you can buy now and fly where you fly. Use the frequencies that you use. Use the actual real-world weather at that time while you're flying. So these simulators are high fidelity and can give you a whole lot of ability to, um, to keep your head in the game. So 
my advice would be to build a simple computer uh, with the sole purpose of staying on top of your training or staying on top of your proficiency and then make sure that as part of that investment, you're not just using the keyboard to fly, but the biggest part of your investment will probably be the flight controls that you buy. So just like we have an Xbox controller, there are controllers that will plug in via USB to your, um, to your computer that are the yoke, the throttle, the trim wheel. Some are even, you know, you can get the six packs instruments. You can get uh, GPSs. You can get anything you want. But my, my big thing would be to get the basic control. So you, of course, want your rudder pedals. That's kind of the one thing that people leave out but you want a yoke or a stick, whatever you use, and then you use um, a throttle quadrant. So I would, I would suggest that you get those three main components and then it'll work out really well. And then plugging into a mid-range computer that can run some graphics and then get a simulator like Prepared, which is one that's out now. You can get a sub subscription to that for, I think, a, a fairly low price for an academic thing. So just you keeping up on your skills is, is qualified for that. Um, some of the newer versions of FSX, but another really good one that actually I think controls most like a real airplane is X plane. So if you get a simulator and you invest in this, then you can imagine that will help you a ton in staying sharp and fresh in the meantime. So say that this total investment that you're going to make, and this is a pretty low ball number is $1,500. Okay. You invest $1,500 in a simulator, you're a pilot, and you fly that simulator quite a bit to stay on top of your instrument skills, even just your basic VFR skills, and you're going to find that when you go to an airplane, everything is still there because you're actually practicing it. The only difference is that now it's for real. So I would uh, give you the advice also that you treat that simulator as a real airplane. So make good safety decisions, do all your checklists, um, go through all of the things that you would go through in a real airplane and, and treat it that way, treat it with respect. So another thing to do is to use it regularly. You know, I, I think I've kind of already alluded to that, but there's even the idea of putting yourself on a schedule, say, you know, I'm going to do this every Saturday morning, or I'm going to do this every Monday night, whatever it is, you find a schedule and you schedule those flights. You know, this isn't just something where, you have to schedule an airplane. This is yours. It's in your home. You know, maybe you have to schedule things with your family, but um, it's a very, very valuable tool to stay on top of your skills. So um, again, I find that it's not necessarily the the handling of the airplane that we forget as pilots. I, again, I think it's like riding a bike. I think it's mostly for most people is those little procedural things and how things move around and mixing that all in with controlling the airplane and the decision making that people get really rusty on. Um, it's the flow that a pilot gets when they get into proficiency. They get into these just nice, smooth, they know when things happen, they know how fast they happen, and, uh, and that's the flow. When you're in the flow, things are going really well. When you've been out of flying for a while, you're out of the flow and you're not as proficient. So that is setting up... Um, that's setting up a simulator and using that simulator often. Okay. Next one is work on the wings program. So this is a little bit of a short one and I don't want to go into too much detail here, but the wings program is run by the FAA. And this is a way for you to get notified about seminars in your local area, things that actually qualify as credit toward your flight review. So you know, seminars, workshops, meetings, uh, different things where, um, you know, different airfields or different FBOs around you will put these things on and they will have great, just great seminars or, or, or different things you haven't thought about before, just learning something new. So it's a good place to go to not only learn those subjects, but it's also just really good for networking and you end up meeting a lot of wonderful people at these places. You'll meet great instructors, you'll meet fellow pilots, and that way you can start to build your community. When you build a community around you because you're actively working and participating in that community, then you're gonna find that you are um, 
you are bolstered up by other people because it's just a it's a common thing in aviation for people to help each other out at least the type of people i like to associate myself with so you're going to find a lot of those people at these wings programs and even if you aren't following the wings program in the sense that you know you're you're checking the marks to uh, check things off for your flight review and take care of um, take care of some of that it's still a very useful program. So you can find that on the FAA. Again, I'll put a link to that on the website. It's just a really good program and a great place to uh, to get credit like that. So just as an example, these podcasts that I do and these subjects could be something like a wings program seminar. Um, it, it's fairly common to have something like this or have the FAA or flight service come in and explain what they do or an air traffic controller or an ex-military pilot, pilot, it's it's pretty common to have a wide variety of different perspectives. So it's uh, just a very useful thing. Okay. So next is read books and more. So um, what I mean by more is things like magazines and even online articles. There are many different places to get good continued learning. Okay. Uh, I, I think as a pilot, if you're not continually learning, if you're not continually trying to rehash the things you've done or grow in a way uh, or rather in a subject that maybe you were never really good at, then, you know, you're not progressing. In fact, you're probably regressing. So I think it's really important that we always focus on reading more. Um, I'm going to be talking about other forms of content later about uh, about consuming different types of content. This is specifically about books and magazines. And I think there's a place for that still. You know, I'm, I've never been the type of person or the type of learner that really like to sit down with a book. And so the sort of books that I'm about to recommend are the best of the best. They're easy to sit down with and you'd really enjoy them, okay? They'd be engaging in other words. And of course, this is a limited list. It's not gonna be... Um, all encompassing. There are books that I left out. These are just some I thought of off the top of my head that I thought worked pretty well. And then of course, magazines. So of course, you know, we have our iPads, we have our phones, we have a different way of consuming content these days where like here on this live video on YouTube or this podcast that we're running right now, this is a great way to see things, but it's not the only way. There are some great forms of content out there that are kind of the old school way. And, you know, sometimes my world is so crazy. I'm in front of computers and phones and everything all day that sometimes it's really nice just to have a book, uh, be sitting in my car at the airport under the wing of an airplane and just reading something focused right there without any distractions. Sometimes that's really nice. And so that's why I bring up this old school method, even though I'm sort of a new school person. So uh, the first, some of the first books here or the books here are Stick and Rudder, an amazing book that was written in the 1930s, I believe, that will just blow your mind in terms of how it explains how things work with an airplane. Um, I don't think you truly know how an airplane flies until you read this book because it, it just summarizes it so well and explains things in such a way where you can just really connect to what the airplane is actually doing, how the wing is working, how lift is produced, all of these things that are happening to you. Um, I read a chapter in this book on wind uh, several months ago, and it com- it completely changed my perspective on wind. Okay, I know that sounds crazy, but um, we go through these periods where we need to learn certain things at the right time. So what I mean by that is there's a time when it's it's good for us to learn a certain subject, okay? So this is the type of book that you could learn, you could read um, in the very beginning of your training and not understand much of it, maybe grasp a couple of the concepts and then read it again in another few years or another year and just completely have a new experience with the book and understand it on a whole different and new level. So that is the that is what I get out of Stick and Rudder. It's this book that continually um, impresses me with the way that it's explained. And I know that those professional pilots or any pilot out there that has read them 
does understand um, does understand that concept and the fact that this book is just just spot on. Okay, so that is the art of, or rather, stick and rudder. Okay, the next one is the art of flying. This is a great book as well. That uh, you know, along the lines of stick and rudder, maybe not quite as iconic, but um, just another great perspective. Another one I didn't put in here was uh, was uh, Dick Collins from um, from Sporties, or he was very much associated with Sporties. He wrote a lot of good books as well. So Dick or Richard Collins uh, wrote a lot of good books as well. Okay, Fate is the Hunter. This is another old book that is a uh, kind of a hard read sometimes because it does use some very deep language and a, a vast vocabulary. But it is a a very poignant book as well. Another one, The Killing Zone. I really like this book because it dispels a lot of myths about aviation in terms of safety, in terms of um, aircraft and training and all these things. And it's all done with data. Okay, It's written by a professor from uh, Middle Tennessee State University. And he goes through, he's an NTSB investigator as well, or, or helps volunteer in his area. I'm not quite sure if he's officially connected to them, but he helps out with, uh, with any accidents in that, in that area. And he just connects a lot of the data, okay? He says, okay, here, here are the actual pilots that are dangerous and why they're dangerous. And here's how you can uh, build safety in your favor and how that takes place through your training and what sort of things you need to be doing. So The Killing Zone is a very good book that I've recommended to a lot of people and continue to do so. So that is The Killing Zone. Okay. And then we get into magazines. So um, a lot of good magazines out there. I'll just read several of them now. You've probably heard of them before. There's AOPA Pilot Magazine. Great magazine. Again, you know, some some cool perspectives there on training. Um, You're going to see... Articles on aircraft sometimes, that doesn't impress me, okay? I'm not in the market for a jet. I'm not in the market for a brand new Bonanza. I'd love to be, but I'm just not, and I don't think the the majority of us are. Um, So I don't like that sort of stuff, but I like the articles that give us a different perspective. There's this one series, I believe it's in Flying Magazine, and it's called I Learned About Flying From That. And it tells these real-world stories that people fess up to or or that happened to them that teach us some pretty big lessons about aviation. So that's another magazine is Flying Magazine. They do a fantastic job as well. Sport Aviation by EAA. EAA is the organization that puts on AirVenture in Oshkosh. So you've probably heard of Oshkosh before. They do a really great magazine. Amazing imagery in that magazine. Just some of the best photos out there. And then Flight Training Magazine, which is actually my favorite you know, even though I'm an instructor and I do this every day, I really like seeing different perspectives on even small and simple subjects. And I just like that the entire magazine of flight training magazine is all about those subjects. So those subjects are in the other magazines, but because the whole magazine is just chucked full of it, I really enjoy flight training magazine. Okay. All right, so this next one is kind of interesting, okay? This is, uh, you may or may not disagree with this, but retake a ground school, okay? Or if you still have access to the ground school that you originally took, go in and rehash that, you know? Um, this, is, this is something that I found in my training recently in getting through my advanced ratings that because I was away from that initial training for so long, I forgot a lot of the material. So maybe this is something you do every five or 10 years is you just retake a ground school and you go through every single subject again. Because as we do that, we get into a deeper level of understanding on each particular subject. And then maybe from there we say, hey, I wanna know a little bit more about the temperatures that are most common for carb ice and and then you dig down deeper, maybe do some research online and study that subject. But it's just a way to kickstart and refresh all of that stuff that you've had before. Even if you're a professional pilot doing this every single day, there are subjects that you're going to forget just 100%. 
you will forget those subjects. And that's just the way it is. Maybe you're not retaking a ground school. Maybe you're out of flying a little bit right now, but you want to be getting into instrument training eventually, maybe sometime in the next few years. And so what you decide to do is you decide to take a new ground school. You decide to do um, instrument ground school, okay? That's one thing you want to jump into. So start something new. Start that process of moving forward. I always tell you on this podcast and elsewhere, I tell this to everybody, just one step after the other, that's how you get through aviation. That's how you get through this process. You know, I, I've done, uh, I've done what a lot of you have to do and I've juggled my ratings with life and other financial obligations and family and all of these things that were pushing me. And I looking at it at its entirety from the top down, I wouldn't be able to just approach that and say, Oh yeah, I'm just going to go take my check ride today. Okay. But what I did is I took that one little step at a time. So again, Maybe starting a ground school right now is a good idea for you to at least get that started. It's a step in the right direction. So that is retaking a ground school or in this case, actually uh, taking a ground school, uh, something new you want to work on. Okay, the next one is join a club. There are a lot of clubs out there. This kind of sounds like uh, a little bit of a funny one. You know, it, it's almost like we're in the fifth grade and we're joining some club to uh to learn how to color or something, but th this is, uh, there are a lot of great organizations out there and, and many communities where you can link up with that are just a great resource to keep your head in the game. So naming a few of these off, there's the IMC club, which is a, a club that is put on by the EAA that goes through instrument scenarios and different training scenarios. And it, they're discussed as a group discussion. So those clubs exist around around the nation in different areas, many different areas. It's very likely that there is one nearby you. And so uh, that's a good way to stay proficient. And while at the same time, meeting some other fellow aviators in your local area. There are EAA chapters, Exper Experimental Aircraft Association chapters. These chapters are often actually geared around um, home build aircraft. And a lot of the times what they'll do is they'll offer, sometimes they'll even offer uh, or have a flying club attached to them where they offer very affordable instruction. They definitely most of the time offer opportunities to help build experimental aircraft. And other than that, it's just a great community to be a part of. They will also put on their own seminars that you can go and be a part of. They usually have a barbecue or something each month. Um, they have regular meetings. So really good thing to be involved in. I've had some great times, uh, stepping in on some EAA chapters that I think, uh, I think you guys would enjoy too. So that's something else you could do. There are flying clubs. Okay. So flying clubs, this is an interesting thing and it's, it's actually, it's a little bit difficult for us here on the internet to consume it because there are some rules and regulations in terms of advertising a flying club. So a flying club is kind of an insider's way of saying, okay, we are all going to share the cost of aircraft ownership. And by doing so, by having monthly dues or whatever it is, we will have a reduced cost to flying this airplane. It's a very affordable and awesome way to fly. There are usually instructors attached to those clubs and it's probably the best scenario, honestly, to learn how to fly and keep flying. Um, the problem is, is that there are regulations that prevent flying clubs from advertising their services. They don't want people to be advertising a flying club like it's a flight school. So you're going to find that these clubs are hard to locate. And what you need to do is just ask person to person. I suppose you could do that online through forums. Say, hey, is there a flying club in this area? Um, those are the sort of things that are kind. It's kind of like it's kind of like a partial ownership on on steroids, okay? Um, but there are some regulations that prevent them from advertising their services. So they are a little bit hard to find, but they are the best once you find them. Okay, there's the commemorative Air Force or CAF. Uh, they have meetings as well, and you can help in the restoration or the participation in, in some events around the commemorative Air Force. So they maintain 
all sorts of different kinds of warbirds that are for the most part, or they, they would be um, warbirds that are out of service. Uh, you know, starting from World War I all the way up, you're gonna find uh, different, based on where you're at, different ability to, to participate in that process. You know, you might have meetings where you watch the airplane. You might have local air shows at your small airport where you're showing off the airplane and doing that. You might participate in actually bringing an airplane to a larger air show. Uh, the Commemorative Air Force is a, a great, great organization. Okay, and then there's the Young Eagles. Um, the Young Eagles is something that's a little more active in terms of the flying component because the Young Eagles is an organization that gives kids, teenagers, rides in airplanes, and they do so for um, for free, basically. So a kid will sign up. And, and go fly with the Young Eagles and get a flying experience, a positive flying experience. Those that don't go on to become pilots, and I'm sure many of them do, I, I'm not sure what the uh, EAA has had to check in on that. So I'll have to look into those numbers and see how many actually became pilots. But even if they don't become pilots, they're going to be in favor of aviation. You know, They're not gonna be the sort of people that complain about the noise at the local airport. So those are the different types of clubs, um, IMC club, EAA chapters, flying clubs, CAF, Young Eagles. I'm sure there are some I forgot. So let me know what those are and I will be sure to log those away in my memory so that I bring those up next time. Okay, uh, the next one is attend seminars. So AOPA puts on a lot of great seminars online. I attend some seminars from SAFE and NAFI. They are some aviation educator uh, seminars. Those are really good as well. Um, but AOPA does a lot of these online. They do rusty pilot seminars that are local. And then EAA will also do seminars as well. A lot of this is moving to online webinar types. But of course, there are also those local things that you can take up in, you know, you can be a part of that will help you uh, help you go through that as well. Okay. Um, let's get to the next one here. That was just a really quick one. And that is go to an air show. Okay. Now, of course, you're going to have a blast looking at all the eye candy at the air show. We all know that we love hearing the sound of a P-51 whistling as it flies overhead. And what's better is when there's several of them in formation with a B-17 or something else. Of course, we're going to love the eye candy of the air show. Okay. But here, talking about staying sharp while we're on the ground, there are a lot of other things at these air shows that happen that I find very beneficial. Maybe it's the, um, the talk from a World War II veteran okay, that you're sitting in on. Maybe it's uh, the forums or the different seminars surrounding that where you can sit in and learn a new subject or get freshened up on a subject, whatever it is. Some of them will probably even be wings credits um, for some of these things. So it's the things surrounding the air show that are really beneficial. You know, when I go to an air show like Oshkosh and everyone, I'm at, everyone dreams of flying in there, right? They fly in, they land on the dot, they camp, they see all the amazing airplanes, you know, the, the different airplanes visiting that year. But the value of an air show like Oshkosh or Sun and Fun, those types of air shows, is the things going on that are not about airplanes, okay? I like to go to these places to improve myself. So, for example, at Oshkosh this year, and I lightly participated in that last year, I will be participating in the Pilot Proficiency Center at Oshkosh and working, on, uh, working as an instructor on a Redbird simulator there, helping other rusty pilots or, or just pilots in general come in and get a little bit of free time with an instructor, okay? So this is a great opportunity for someone that wants to learn something, that gets hold of an actual really nice simulator, an instructor that's that's there and helping them and, and working on a scenario with them, and they get to learn all of that, okay? And free of charge. So that is just one thing. There are hundreds of forums at Oshkosh. I'm gonna be doing several this year, hundreds of forums, hundreds of workshops, um, anything you can imagine surrounding aviation 
there is a subject for you. And it actually ends up becoming a problem at a large air show like this because there are usually five things going on at once that you just are dying to go to. And so you have to choose between good, better, and best at these air shows, at these larger air shows when it comes to um, comes to seeing these things, okay? So you're also going to see the progression of the industry when you go to these air shows. You're gonna see the newest airplanes, the newest tech. Again, unless you're in the market, that's not gonna be such a big deal, but it keeps your head in the game, you know? It's nice to know how things are moving, how things are improving in aviation and, and how uh, all that is working for you. Now, of course, above and beyond everything else, we've learned something, we've saw some cool stuff, the biggest thing is just to get inspired and get that energy to move forward. And if I go to an air show, and this has happened to me before, if I go to an air show and put in all this time and effort expecting to go there and be inspired and for whatever reason, by my own omission or, or whatever it is, I don't end up feeling that and I end up feeling like I've wasted my time, it's one of the worst feelings ever. So You've got to go in with a plan to these places and have a plan to learn something new, to get inspired, meet new people, and come away a better aviator for it. So that is going to an air show, which I highly recommend. Okay, the next one is engage in hangar talk. So hangar talk is this thing where you don't have to be in an actual hangar to do it, but what it is is you're essentially just BSing with your buddies, okay? This is the, the fishing stories of flying. So you're sitting around a hangar, you're talking about these experiences that you've had, and you're just hanging out at the airport. So um, there's not a ton of hanging out here at my airport. Uh, people are usually busy when they're actually on the airport. We have a lot of commercial operators and things. So there's not a whole lot of this going on, but you know, I, I do try to to be part of the community there. Um, there was this guy the other day that flew in in a King Air to the airport. And what I usually do when I see people around like that is I, I go and ask them if they want to ride. Because usually I'm headed out anyway and say, hey, do you want to ride somewhere? So I just started talking to this guy and he ended up being from Scottsdale. And they came up in their, in their King Air and they were going to be doing a float rating later. But they wanted to know where to go for dinner and they wanted to know this and that and flying places. And so I just ended up talking to him for 20 minutes. Um, and it, it, you know, that would be hangar talk right there. Um, another thing we do around here is after the busy day of all the operators working here is we have pilot night on Thursday nights. So there's this restaurant right across the street from my office here. It's called Beluga Lake Lodge. And we go and we have burgers. You can order the Cessna burger. Kid you not. It's right on the menu with a little float plane on the menu because you can overlook the lake, Beluga Lake. So um, we have pilot night, okay? And so that's our hangar talk. So in other words, this is uh, an opportunity for you to just be part of the community. And hanging out at the airport is free, okay? 100% free. You might have to go and get a security badge, but hanging out at the FBO or hanging out on the airport grounds is totally free. And more often than not, it's very encouraged. In some situations, it wouldn't be like at really busy airports, but... For the most part, no one's going to stop you from just hanging out the FBO or hanging out on the ramp as long as you're not, you know, fiddling with other people's airplanes or touching their airplanes without permission. People in aviation love that you love it too, okay? And they, they want to be a part of that. They'll probably come up and talk to you and you're going to make a new friend. So that is hangar talk. All right. So uh, the next one is watch YouTube. Okay. So YouTube is such an incredible source for information these days. It's, uh, it's kind of goes without saying, you know, you can go there to learn something. You can go there to be entertained and the aviation community on Facebook is just really vibrant. And a, a lot of my friends are on YouTube and, uh, I just, I really like sharing aviation media. And so, you know, I, I associate with a lot of these people. So a couple channels you're going to want to check out. First off, you're going to want to check out our channel. Um, this is where uh, you'll see Aviator Cast Live, which you're maybe seeing right now on YouTube, where you'll see the Angle of Attack show, which is kind of our story-based show. Cool flying experiences, mostly in Alaska, but also other places. Um, so that's our channel. You're going to want to check that out and subscribe there. 
Okay, Flight Chops. Many people have heard of Flight Chops, Steve Thorne. He's a great guy. He's, he calls himself the weekend warrior pilot. He is always trying to improve himself, always trying to move toward new goals, okay? Um, he's flown all sorts of different types of airplanes because he's he has such a good channel that he gets, uh, gets invited to do these experiences. And one of the best guys, okay? Uh, Ex-TV producer, now does this full time and you really can't go wrong with flight chops, okay? Um, Steve O1 Canevo. So this is one of of a guy named Steve down in Southern Florida that flies TBMs and caravans and often a, a, a number of other aircraft. And he flies to the Bahamas quite a bit and shares his experiences. He's really good at making you feel like you're in the airplane. He asks you how you're doing for the day. It's kind of a Mr. Rogers type style with a really neat aviation twist to it. And he does a great job, okay? Uh, very popular as well. Um, the finer points, so Jason Miller, he is more geared toward the aviation training side, so flight training and, and tips and tricks there. He also is the original aviation podcast, from what I understand. He does a great job if you're just in it for the pure education of it. Um, and there's uh, there's just so many good things to say about the tips and tricks that Jason shares on his channel. So that's the finer points. Um, Josh Flowers, Mr. Aviation 101. So he is out of uh, just south of Austin, Texas, um, and he is a CFI, uh, just graduated from college, and has had a, an aviation channel for quite a, a, a long time, and he does a variety of different content, whether it's sharing someone flying for the first time, whether it's a fan or, an, or someone that's uh, looking to get into it for the first time, maybe in their later years or flying with his dad, or flying with his girlfriend, or just going for a scenic flight, or an actual training flight. There are a bunch of different experiences he shares, and he also does some kind of biography things on other people too. So good variety there, um, fantastic content that's getting better all the time. Okay, Matt Guthmiller. Matt Guthmiller flies around a bonanza all over the place. I don't know how, how he does it. It seems like he doesn't sleep because he flies for like, 16 hours a day to get somewhere. Um, but he's practiced at this. He's, he was the youngest pilot to circumnavigate the globe and he did it at, uh, gosh, was it 18 years old, but he might've been 17. Um, anyway, he was really young. It, it could have even been 19, but he was really young when he did it. And, uh, now he's moving into doing YouTube videos and, uh, and does a great job with that as well. He's pretty hardcore in terms of what he does. So if you want to see a lot of real world IFR flying to different places and how that's managed, um, Matt does a good job. And he also, you know, weaves in story there too, like go to restaurants to go to and things like that. So Matt's a friend of mine, does a great job. Also Trent Palmer. Trent Palmer is is a really cool guy, uh, owns a drone company and also flies a, a Bush aircraft, but he has his own kit Fox that is painted in patriotic colors. So it, he calls it the Freedom Fox. It's on big Bush tires. He lives um, in the Reno area and being a video editor himself just does amazing, amazing content. So he's another guy to check out, um, does a great job. I just think he's, he's highly, highly entertaining. And then there's another guy that's uh, just starting. He only has a few videos, but man, when I watch his videos, I just laugh my head off. And I, I just think he's one of the best YouTubers out there, even though he's not very well known. And his name is Super Arrow. I just love his channel to death. Um, I think he's so funny. The last one he did was flying to go get Girl Scout cookies. And then he got all these Girl Scout cookies and he was cramming them in his mouth, trying to like narrate the flight and everything while he had all these cookies in his mouth. He's just really funny and does a great job with it. So that is YouTube. Okay. Some of the YouTubers that I would follow. All right. Um, Instagram. Okay. That is the next one. Now, oh, there was a time when I saw Instagram, my wife was always on it. I'm like, what's, you know, what's the deal here? It's, it's okay. But you know, it's not Facebook. It's not Twitter. It's not Snapchat. Um, and I didn't really get it, okay? I didn't really get why it was such a thing. But then as someone that produces media and, you know, I, I love taking pictures, I love doing videos, and I ended up just starting to share my stuff on there because it was a good creative outlet 
for me to just do it, okay? And that's the thing about YouTube. You have to stand on your merits. You don't just give a status update. You get on there to share something beautiful or something cool. And, and so I find that Instagram is a great place for people that are doing those sort of things. They're actively flying. They're actively trying to stay in the flying. They're around airplanes. They're, they're connecting with the community. And honestly, what I found is that this is one of the best communities right now. So I could have just come in and said social media. And that's actually what I started out with as a title here. It says social media. Let's talk about Twitter, Facebook. But no. Okay. Those other communities, you know, there are some good groups on Facebook. Twitter is completely dead to me. Um, I don't think there's any usefulness on Twitter. Uh, but Instagram, I have found and met so many friends on Instagram that are just eager to share in their passion for aviation. People that are out there doing it or people that are trying to do it. People that just love to, um, to check out little videos or pictures or whatever it is. It is, it is the most vibrant and healthy social media platform out there. And I would say it's even more healthy than something like YouTube. It's just unregulated in terms of what you see is what you get. You follow someone and they show up in your stream and, um, and it's a good picture or a good video or whatever it is. And that's what you get. So I really love Instagram. I've met so many friends from Instagram and, uh, I just can't say enough good things about it. I really encourage you to get on there and sign up and follow some people on there. Uh, check out the aviation hashtag. Um, just a lot of great people. Um, most everyone I know is using it these days. All of those YouTubers I just mentioned, uh, I am, this is where I spend a lot of my time, even probably more time than YouTube. There's just a lot of great content on Instagram and I think it's only going to get better. So it's a good place for you to spend your time. All right. So that is it for our, um, our content for now. I know that was kind of rapid fire. I shared more than I usually share. And so now we're going to get into the closing thoughts and close out the show here. Join us next week for another exciting topic or interview with a great guest. All AviatorCast resources can be found at aviatorcast.com. Subscribe to AviatorCast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, and other podcast services. Did you enjoy the show? Review AviatorCast on iTunes or similar service. If your review is aired on the show, we'll send you an official AviatorCast t-shirt. As always, we'd love to hear from you. Write AviatorCast at me at aviatorcast.com to introduce yourself or to ask any questions you may have about aviation. Now for the final release clearance, back to Chris Palmer. All right, guys, a huge thanks for joining me on this episode of Aviator Cast. It was a pleasure to have you guys here. Um, you know, this whole idea behind staying sharp while you're on the ground and a bench warmer's guide, right? It's the perfect term, a bench warmer. It's kind of what you are for a while as you're sitting on the sidelines waiting for the opportunity or, or the situation to come up again when you're going to be able to fly. And it's great to be prepared at that point when you're getting there. But aviation is such a great community. There are many, many people in the industry that are just eager to help those out that are passionate about it and want to be part of it. I know that I'm that way. You know, I get really excited when people write me and I really appreciate when people write me and say, hey, thanks for what you do, or what do you think about this? Or, hey, I just started my training. You know, I, I thrive on that sort of stuff. And there are so many people in, in the industry that do. And so no matter what you're doing in this, and there, there are a lot of just kind of personal things here, like reading books and whatever, but whatever you do in doing this, try to be more a part of the community. And I think you'll find that there are people out there willing to invite you along for a ride or people that will give you a little bit of advice or people that will hook you up with the right person to, um, to take the next step. So that's what aviation is all about. It's all about paying it forward because really none of us got to where we are without that assistance. So I encourage you guys to keep going that direction. So if uh, just kind of as a closing message here, if any of you are um, looking for um, ground school, this is something that we do at Angle of Attack at Aviator Training is we have online ground school. So we have it for 
private. Um, I'm currently working on the instrument course, and then we're going to have a commercial course later this year. So um, if you're in the market for it and you like my style, you like what I have to say, then this is kind of the format that we use in my ground school, a very conversational format where we slow down on topics and, and share different details. And I do those live as well, which means that you can actually ask questions as we're going along. It's a, a really great process. So if you're in the market for that, give us a, give us a shout. Uh, go to aviatortraining.com, check out what we have. We'd be more than happy to have you. So keep taking that next step, okay? There are a lot of different steps you can take. I shared a ton of them today. I thought this is a poignant moment to do that because this is something that a lot of you need. You know, a lot of you are on the sidelines. I, I, I get a, a, a good amount of messages from those that say, hey, I'm gonna be doing my training next year or I'm waiting till my kids grow up or whatever it is. I know a lot of you are on the sidelines. Don't put yourself down for that. Just keep building yourself up and taking that next step in aviation if you really do want to get there and if you just take things little by little then eventually you're going to get to the point where you're a pilot and you're not going to know what happened okay but it's those little steps along the way that uh that get you there all right so that is it for this episode as always you can write me at me at aviatorcast.com with any suggestions for content or maybe you need some advice, or maybe you just want to say thank you or hello, whatever it is, feel free to write me. And I appreciate you guys being a part of this community. We couldn't do it without you and your contribution, so keep it up. So until next time, throttle on. Throttle on.